All right. So um, today, as we continue to unfold the social meta instructions, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the grammar of social meta, meaning the linguistic structure of, of how this practice works, uh, at least as far as I understand, which is very much an emerging understanding. Um, and, and I think talking about grammar with this stuff is really, it's really helpful because as one of my mentors, um, Ken Wilbur uh, often points out, um, you know, you can be a completely fluent speaker without having any understanding of the grammar of the language you're speaking. In fact, that's, that's how all of us learn language, unless you have like a linguistic professor, <laughs> parents or something uh, who are teaching you grammar early. Um, you know, we all learn uh, to speak without knowing the rules of the language. Uh, and then later in school, you know, we go to school and still most of us don't learn <laughs> the, the, the grammar of the language we're speaking. Uh, and so um, to know the grammar, to know how something works is not required to do it. Um, but it's very much helpful if you're going to try to help other people do it, or if you want to have a deeper understanding of what you're doing. Um, so I wanted to just share a little bit of the, of sort of the grammar here of what we're, what we're working with. Um, at the heart of how we're working with social meta, and I think this is because it's an out loud practice and out loud practices seem to really be aided by, by words. Um, we're working with a phrase. Uh, this meta phrase. And we started with a very um, simple phrase and, and uh, Victor led us in a, in a perfect example of this this morning of uh, the may it arise, may loving awareness arise, may compassionate presence arise, may happiness arise, whatever the it is, uh, working with a quality of, uh, of presence or of a dimension of the open heart and inviting it to arise. Um, that's a simple phrase. Um, and it has in that phrase a wish. This is the kind of one of the key parts of the, of the meta phrase is there's a wish embedded in the phrase. There's something that we're wishing for. Uh, in this case, compassionate presence. Um, now, I'd say at the very minimum, a meta phrase has to have a wish. <laughs> there has to be something that we're wishing for. Um, that's kind of what makes it a meta phrase. It's a well wish. Um, it's a prayer by uh, using other language. Um, um, meta is Buddhist prayer in a way. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I often can show up in, in the basic structure grammar of social meta, but it doesn't have to, as you can see with the, with the phrase, may it arise. Um, is that there, there can often, is often a subject uh, as well in the phrase. That is uh, a person or group of people or category of beings that we are uh, sharing that wish with. So we're, instead of just may it arise, <laughs> where there's not a clear sense of the subject, it could be for everyone, it could just be for me, you know, who knows what is going on in the interiority of someone who's saying that phrase. It's hard to tell. Um, but when we actually include a subject and we are using things like pronouns or we're coming up with particular categories, you know, for instance, you know, with the situation, the political uh, unfolding in Russia, we could may all Russian people be happy. And really you could call to mind a particular group. Uh, or um, category of beings, may all animals be happy and healthy. You know, um, we can, e e there's really no limit there in terms of how we parse out um, who, who it is that we're wishing this, um, this for, but that's the subject, the who in this practice. Um, and so I'd say that uh, meta phrases um, have to at least have a wish in them and then can also have a subject. Um, so that's the, in, in a sense, that's the elemental, elementary grammar uh, of a social meta practice that would include that as a, as a kind of minimum. Then you can build, you know, more complex uh, structures and sentences and things. You can rotate through phrases, you can pick phrases, you can, you know, you can um, go through a sequence of different subjects with a particular intention in mind. 
you know, these practices are very versatile in terms of how you can apply them. Um, so that's why we're focusing on the, on the core grammar. So it's like, if we understand the, uh, the elemental aspect of this, it becomes easier to build. And, you know, once you understand how, how a sentence works, it's much easier to write a paragraph and then a book and so forth. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about that. And, and this is important too, for our practice today, we're going to explore the practice of pith meta, um, which I first learned about this through Sharon Salzberg and um, working with, uh, with her instructions on loving kindness practice. And she would often share with people and suggest that if you're, uh, say you're on a deep meta retreat and you're doing a lot of meta practice at some point, and here I'd say, or if you're doing social meta and it starts to happen, um, because social meta in some ways maybe is like the, can be like the equivalent of being on retreat, um, you start to notice that you are actually feeling it. You're actually, the, the wish becomes a reality. You know, your wish comes true. And you're suddenly not just wishing for compassionate presence to arise, but you are feeling compassionate presence or you are being compassionate presence. Um, uh, in that case, um, Sharon would suggest that having this whole phrase can become clunky and get in the way of the living experience of, of, of the practice. And in that case, she said, you know, feel free to shorten the phrase down to a pith, to its pith. Like the, what's the essential wish, the one or two usually words that points to what you're wishing for. And you could just shorten it down to the pith in that, in those cases and just say happy or compassionate presence or just compassion, um, whatever, whatever feels the most pithy. Uh, the most kind of simple. Um, and so in this practice too, and so in social metta, we found it really helpful to introduce uh, the, uh, the pith phrase. Um, and that is essentially just working with the wish, uh, just being with the wish. And, and, and here what's important, uh, I think, to, to highlight is that sometimes in, in metta practice, we are aspiring you know, we're wishing and sometimes we are realizing um, we're um, it moves from inclining the mind toward the open heart to being open hearted. And what it's important to, I think, to recognize those two different uh, possibilities because um, the purpose of the practice isn't to be open hearted. It is actually to incline toward open heartedness. And if it arises, great um, that's beautiful and it's a byproduct of doing the practice but it's not the purpose of the practice it's it's a it's a it's a result that can happen from doing the practice so it, you know even if you're working with if you're working with the full phrase or you're just working with the pith it's always possible to share it in a way where it's more of an aspiration it's like may compassionate presence arise you know i'm not feeling it i don't even know what it is uh i sure wish it, it were here you know, that's fine. Like that's actually totally legit to, to practice metta in that way, to wish for it to arise. Uh, it's also totally legit if it arises to just say compassionate presence. Um, or even you can say may compassionate presence arise and you can feel it. It doesn't, uh, you know, it, it may have arisen here, but has it arisen everywhere for everyone throughout all space and time? Well, if not, you can, you can there's, there's, there's more. There's more to aspire to. Um, and I think that's always the case with Metta. Uh, 